being able to know when grace is in you, entering into your decision making, and being able to work with it and uh, move towards it. Mm -hmm. uh, discernment is a very <coughs> difficult thing to do. It is, yes, and, and uh, uh, Lonigan was a Jesuit, of course, and so the whole issue of, of how do you tell the difference between feelings that are drawing you towards God and feelings that, that may look like they're okay on the surface, but in fact are drawing you away from God. Right. The whole problem of how to distinguish between those uh, is something that he dealt with uh, through the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, which right. every Jesuit uh, is well acquainted with. Sure. Uh, sure. It's, it's the centerpiece of their spirituality. Um, Lonergan, in the course of his lifetime, pretty much left behind that older language about grace, not because it wasn't true. It is true. Right. It is, and, and it's, in some situations, it's still necessary to be able to, to, to use that framework of talking about sanctifying grace and actual grace and the whole philosophical uh, backdrop against which that kind of language is used. But as he reflected more on the issue and as his, as his own thinking developed, he started to talk more about grace in terms of an experience of falling in love with God mm. or of a state of, of, of being in love with God, of, a, of, a, of an orientation. Uh, um, he talks about an undertow sure. uh, that is, is, is not something that's entirely behind the scenes, but that is experienced by the person who receives it um, as an affective um, directional push or pull or sure. orientation. Something within. Yes, yeah, something within. Yeah. Something that that, uh, it, that is a gift, um, but that however it happens, either gradually and uh, in fits and starts over time so that you barely notice it mm -hmm. happening when it's happening or, or whether it happens dramatically and in a moment, what grace does is it shifts your desires shifts the basic orientation of your life so that you are you, you, you begin to leave behind older your, your old ways of thinking and of mm -hmm. feeling mm -hmm. um, your 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 selfishness mm -hmm. uh, uh, or even your your ways of being generous that before were just limited to your crowd or to sure. your family uh, and you start opening up to uh, loving the way God loves, yeah. which is uh, un un without limit, without un unconditional. Unconditional love, yeah. yeah. He's talking about what used to be called charity, the habit of charity, right. the, the gift of charity, yeah. which is loving God as a friend and loving everyone and everything that God loves. It's a tall order, and right. that's why only grace can make it possible. Right. Um, but what he's saying is, it happens to us, it, it, it becomes a part of us, in a way that, that leaves us consciously affected. Uh, because it's, as human beings, we're knowers and, and, and deciders and feelers, right. and, and all those specifically human parts of us are affected by grace. Right. From the little bit I know of Lonergan, he develops an understanding of the human person that is somewhat transcendent. It goes beyond the old notions of human nature talks about the human subject. Right. Therefore, he does talk about many, the many different components mm -hmm. which inform a, a person's human life. That's right. In my work with people in business, uh, I try to stress Lonergan's understanding of the human person. The reason I became interested in Lonergan in the first place, and this goes back to when I was uh, in college, uh, I was first introduced to, to some of Lonergan's writings over 20 years ago, mm -hmm. um, was that he explained me to myself mm. better than anybody else I'd come across. Mm. Uh, in his philosophical writings, especially in his masterwork, Insight, mm. which is uh, a, a, a very large volume, 800 pages yes, or more. Yes, I've seen it. Uh, yeah, um, massive and intimidating. Mm. Um, what he's really trying to do primarily is to help people 
discover within themselves the basic dynamic structure of being a human being. Mm -hmm. What goes on in you when you are doing the things uh, uh, that represent you at your best? Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he, he relies in part on Thomas, Aqu Thomas Aquinas in the sense that he found this interest in Aquinas too, but he articulates it in a way that Aquinas never did. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about what Lonergan discovered was, in order for you to discover it, you don't have to just believe Lonergan. You can find it in yourself. Mm -hmm. In other words, he says, here's what I've found about what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe me, check it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And essentially what he finds is that at the core of being human is faithfulness to a God-given dynamism or, or drive that's within us, that's a, consciously experienced by us. A self-transcending movement, you m could well, you say? Well, it turns out to be, yes. In other words, what we are fundamentally as human beings isn't selfish, closed-in creatures who are interested uh, in power or gain or something like that. Right. It turns out that what we are, what we are built to do as human beings is to wonder, mm. uh, to understand, to reach correct judgments about the way things really are, mm. uh, to make choices based on real value, mm. the, the, the values that, that are in the universe that God has created, mm. um, and to love mm. everything that is of value. Mm. Um, and what he, sh what, he, what he shows is that unless you cooperate with that dynamism in yourself, the restlessness that makes you wonder about things, or, or the, um, the uneasiness you feel when you when you when you know that you haven't really made a good decision, or that you're about to make a decision that isn't a good one, mm. or, or or the feeling that you have when you know you've got a bright idea, but you're not sure you have the evidence for it yet. Mm. All those are manifestations of this basic dynamism that's driving us beyond ourselves. It's transcendent, as, right. as you said. Right. It's it's dr it's driving us from simply wondering about things, to trying to get a correct answer about things, mm -hmm. to, to making decisions and loving in the light of what, we've, of what we know. Right. And uh, at the root of it all is a desire to know and love everything and ultimately God, right. everything and everyone. Uh, so insight is basically a series of um, not arguments, but exercises. Th some thought, thought experiments? Yes, that, I, that's probably a good way to put it. Thought mm -hmm. experiments. Um, helping the reader discover in himself or herself the reality of wonder. Right. Uh, the reality of inquiry or investigation. Right. What that means. What does it feel like to be asking questions where you're trying to understand something? What does it mean to be looking for evidence once you've got an idea, mm. to see whether your idea holds water or not? Um, it turns out that in order to have ideas and in order to check out the evidence, you usually have to be involved with other people because you can't even think of all the relevant questions that need to be asked. Mm. Um, he talks about what it means to uh, distinguish between values that are greater and values that are, that are lesser. Right. Uh, how, how do you stack those up? Right. In, in concrete situations. Uh, and how does love affect the way we do that whole process? Right. Um, all those things he believes are discoverable. Uh, right. He discovered them in himself. He challenges the reader to discover them in himself or herself. And basically he says, if you're going to disagree with me, you're going to have to use those very activities that I just pinpointed. You're going to have to use those dynamisms to disagree which will only prove my point. Right. Uh, it's not a logical, he, primarily a logical argument. It's an, argu an argument uh, It's a dialect performance. A dialectic of question and answer. 